now. You can also find uh, trend, uh, live captioning at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So um, make sure to utilize that if you need. And I'll start off with a land acknowledgement. So uh, this, this land acknowledgement was created by the Native American Student Development Center on our campus. And rec we recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the, success, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familiar descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since uh, the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values and CERC's values um, of the in inclusion and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land we stand on, but also we recognize that the Muwekma Ohlone people are alive, flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So thank you, and I'll uh, pass it back to Cecilia. Great, thank you so much, Jed. Um, so yeah, so here we have our panelists, um, if they could introduce themselves and get started with their program. Um, we're also open for questions um, and answers later on. So if you have any questions that pop up, feel free to um, send it directly to Jed and I. Thank you. I'll pass it over to uh, Katerina. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Jed and Cecilia. It's a pleasure. Um, Cirque. Uh, so, so honored to be here um, and to kick off this Earth Week of events and uh, deep gratitude to the organizers and to my colleagues who are here. Um, we are hoping to really just have a, hopefully a, a conversation and share. Um, we're lucky to have here, I think, a representation from a variety of different um, you know, points along the trajectory of conservation careers and work with a non local nonprofit organization that I hope uh, you will see as a local resource um, not far from campus. And um, so I'll be uh, just kind of pointing out, we have kind of a brief outline, some introductory points, and along the way I will um, Kind of introduce each of my colleagues and then we hope to have time for um, any questions that you may have and are just really happy to be here with you all today. Um, I'll start off with a really brief introduction of myself and then I'll pass it over to um, Ashley Terry. My name is Katerina Myers. I am an alum of UC Berkeley. I was a conservation resource studies and integrative biology major class of 98 and um, have been um, active with the, uh, I was very active as a CRSSO um, member as an undergrad and um, still connected to the, to the alum community and um, honored to be part of a greater community of uh, folks working in the environmental space. And uh, I also went back to UC Berkeley for graduate work, uh, worked in environmental science policy and management completed a doctorate there with Stephen Welter, uh, broadly speaking in conservation, um, agroecology and regenerative agriculture and native insect population ecology and, and genetics. And uh, I've been with the Conservation Society of California for um, close to three years. Um, really love working with all of the folks here who joined me today and um, enjoy the work um, in particular, my, my position is in the uh, education department, so I get to work with um, school-aged um, students as well as um, families and, and guests to the Oakland Zoo, um, so it's a really dynamic and exciting place to be, um, and I hope to share more about that soon. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Ashley Terry, who's also in education. 
Hello, my name is Ashley Terry, and I am an education specialist at the Oakland Zoo. Um, but before I got into education, I was a zookeeper. Um, so I graduated at UC Berkeley in 2008 um, with a degree in anthropology. And from there, I was actually hired on as a keeper right out of college. Um, I interned first, I was hired on as a keeper. And I was a keeper for about six years, and then I decided keeping was not my my desire. I didn't want to be a keeper for the rest of my life. Um, so I left the zoo for a brief stint, about two years or so, and then I realized that the zoo was where my heart was. And so I came back to the zoo through education. Um, I actually just graduated with my master's in education um, with a focus on environmental education and curriculum writing from Concordia University. And I actually start next month, I'm a little nervous, but I start a doctorate program through Prescott College in sustainable education. So I hope to continue on this conservation mission um, through education and working with the zoo. Um, with that, I will pass it on to Adrienne. Goodness. Congratulations, Ashley. I just heard that. Wow. Um, so I'm Adrian Mersney. I am conservation manager at Oakland Zoo. I actually started out in a career in zookeeping. Um, I graduated from UC, UC, I just want to say UC Berkeley, so bad. I graduated from UC Santa Cruz in 2004 with um, a bachelor's of science in, um, oh my gosh, it's been so long, in biology with a focus in ecology and evolution because right as I declared my degree, they canceled it, so I had to pivot. Uh, so that does happen and you can still get a dream job. Um, and I was a zookeeper for about 12 years, worked, worked with primates with great apes. I worked with chimpanzees and gorillas. Um, and during that process, I kind of started realizing I really wasn't as happy as I wanted to be. I started in zookeeping because I really cared about animal welfare and that's what drove me into the field. And so I ended up going back to school um, and I got a master's degree at Miami University of Ohio. And that had a strong conservation focus and I really fell in love with how inclusive conservation was with communities and I really wanted to be a part of that. Um, so after 12 years of working with primates, I made the super scary choice and was super lucky when I took the leap and I got to join our conservation department here at the zoo and I really love it and it's, it's really amazing. And with that, I will pass it off to Amy Gottliff. Unmute. Hi there, everybody. Um, I love this. It really shows you that what, you know, you could think you want something and you just take a windy road to get there and pivot around and that you, no matter what you think you're, you want to do, flow that way, but then be ready to flow another way. Um, I started out in at Michigan State University. I'm a Detroit girl. Um, really, I was a creative person. So I studied writing, film, videography, um, and kind of business. Um, I'm not quite sure what I wanted to be, um, but um, worked more in those kind of creative businessy fields for a while. Always knew I loved animals. Nature just didn't really know what you could be if you loved doing those things. And I also just love being creative. Um, after a while working there, I ended up traveling and working just in like animal tourism and keep taking people snorkeling and realize like animals and nature is my thing, especially love teaching. So I got my master's degree and teaching credential all around environmental ed and communicating um, about animals and, and joined um, the team at Oakland Zoo um, in education. And at the time, education and conservation were together. And I really learned what the zoo did for conservation and how intriguing it was, these projects around the world um, that had just a variety of needs that were just challenging and interesting to fulfill. And I just, I love both those avenues, but right now I am the VP of conservation, which amazingly includes all the skills I gathered on the way. So it worked out. <laughs> all right, I'll pass it to Dan. Uh, 
I know how to, I know how to work one of these things. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, my name is Dan Flynn. Um, I actually, I graduated from Cal State Long Beach uh, with a bachelor's in human development and anthropology. Um, my career dream at the time was that I was going to go out and film different cultures and animals and uh, write ethnographies and learn about cultures, but they'd all been kind of discovered at that point. So I went into teaching because that was my other thing that I really loved was working with kids. But I kind of found out through after school programming and uh, in classrooms and I taught abroad even teaching English that I wasn't really liking it that much because I didn't want to be with the same people for that long. <laughs> I really, really liked I like mixing up and I wasn't really that passionate about like teaching teaching English or math or any of those things so a uh, summer a uh, part or seasonal job opportunity came up uh, at the zoo as a zoo camp instructor um, and it was teaching different kids teaching something that I loved it worked out perfect so I actually did that for um, about three years plus a bunch of different part-time stuff at the zoo um, so I, I had a bunch of different part-time jobs kind of tied in uh, for the first three years of my zoo career here uh, until I got hired full time at the education department. And then I kind of started actually taking over and leading a lot of those programs that I was teaching. And then eventually I wanted to share my love for the zoo and uh, what I was teaching to a broader scale. So I found an opportunity in marketing and I kind of have that opportunity now to, to teach and reach out to more people, um, which is something that I really love to do. And now I get to do all kinds of stuff, a lot of creative stuff too, which which was a big passion in the education department that I had from. So now I'm doing social media, website um, signage, and just more recently, even in exhibit design. So there's a lot of creative opportunity now and uh, I get to reach a bigger scale. So it's pretty pretty great job where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. I, sorry, I just assume Wilson knows he's coming up next. Yeah. Um, Hi, I'm, I'm Wilson. I use he series um, pronouns. I am currently a junior at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm doing simultaneous degrees in conservation resource studies and anthropology. Um, a lot of good anthro majors here. Um, but um, I got involved with the zoo at first. Um, my freshman year, I did a, a little research project on their history um, and found myself interning in the conservation department. Um, and I did an internship in the animal care division as well. Um, and now I'm doing some research on guest experience. Um, and I, I, I've always thought that zoos were really interesting places to explore, you know, how people learn about nature. Um, and I started, I started as an educator in, at the Santa Barbara Zoo in, in high school. Um, and so I'm lucky to be involved with the zoo today. Thank you. I wanted, so we have a few topics that we just wanted to share in terms of the mission and the vision of the Conservation Society of California. So you might be wondering, um, like I certainly would have been, what the connection is between the Oakland Zoo and the Conservation Society. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And um, I'm, I'm actually gonna ask uh, Wilson if you're willing to share, cause I know it's something that you've thought a lot about um, kind of the, the big broad brushstrokes, almost like big history of zoos and aquariums and how the Oakland Zoo fits into that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the history of the zoo is, is um, a really big and complicated topic and I'll, I'm gonna give you kind of the, the really quick version. Um, but the history of the Oakland Zoo is sort of reflective of a lot of these big changes that we've seen. Um, and also it all sort of reflects you know, the attitudes of our society towards nature and towards um, other countries and all this kind of stuff. Um, the Oakland Zoo started in 1919. It actually was sort of, there was an Oakland Natural History Museum um, that was run by a big game hunter. Um, and he had a small collection of living animals as part of the museum. Um, in 1927, it rebranded as the Alameda County Botanical and Zoological Society. Um, um, again, at this time, zoos were very focused on sort of taxonomy. They were really interested in like displaying as many species as possible um, and, and, you know, viewing animals that way. In 1937, it moved to its current location in Nolan Park, which is where it's situated. Um, and from then, the changes in the Oakland Zoo look a lot like changes in, in American zoos more broadly. You know, you start 
there's these revolving ideas around animal rights and animal welfare um, and exhibit design on top of like shifts in what animals we had access to for a long time. You know, zoos were getting animals through these very colonial relations. Um, and as those died down, there was an increasing focus on, oh, we can't just take these things anymore. And that's where some of these new um, animal welfare, welfare ideas come out of because there's actually a need to breed animals in captivity. And so zoo professionals started thinking really differently about, um, you know, these weren't just like items in a museum, they were living things and needed to be cared for in certain ways. Um, and it wasn't like a straight trajectory where welfare just got better. There was ups and downs and sort of a sanitary modernism period, um, which may be, you know, some images that come to mind when we think of a zoo, that really sterile concrete cage type thing. But increasingly, um, zoos have pivoted away from that, thankfully, um, towards more naturalistic exhibits and a preference for getting animals to display natural behaviors. Um, and on like, as all of this is changing, obviously, biodiversity is changing in general, right? As the biodiversity crisis is coming on and increasingly people who care about wildlife, we're noticing that there's less of it in the world. Um, and their zoos take on sort of this conservation purpose um, of breeding animals in captivity and sort of doing in situ and ex situ conservation. Um, and all of this happened at the Oakland Zoo as well. And in 1987, um, our now retired CEO, Joel Parrott um, became a part of the zoo um, and kind of revolutionized the Oakland Zoo's animal welfare strategy, um, sort of cemented Oakland Zoo as a leader within the broader zoo community in some of these issues of captive welfare. Um, and in 2017, what was then at that point known as the East Bay Zoological Society was rebranded as the Conservation Society of California to reflect this kind of mission of conservation um, and all of that. And then the most recent sort of major development in the zoo in 2018, there was an expansion into the hills um, and a new exhibition called the California Trail, which is super, super, I think it's like one of the best exhi zoo exhibits I've ever seen um, that focuses on California wildlife. So, so I hope you kind of see in that history, a lot of this trajectory towards a focus on native species and a focus on what we can teach people to help them sort of uh, live more sustainably. So the brief version, sorry. Thank you so much, Wilson. That's a great job. <laughs> it is, um, as you allude to, it is a much more complicated and, and um, nuanced story. And I think all of us are really interested um, in, you know, broadly speaking, the, the conservation ethics and, and um, you know, our relationship, human relationship to the broader ecosystems, not to mention the, the uh, biodiverse systems that we're part of. Um, we did want to talk a little bit more about the mission of this nonprofit organization um, and some of the best folks to do that uh, would be our conservation um, leader, Amy, if you want to talk a little bit about what conservation means today for the Conservation Society of California. Sure. Um, yeah, Wilson, that was so cool to hear that. Um, and I can I can see a bunch of the history myself. I've been once I got into the zoo and found all these different little niches and and kept growing. I've stuck around. So it's been 20 years almost. Um, and even just to see and I'm very involved with zoos all over the country to see all of them change so much. Um, like a lot of zoos, we realized two amazing things. One, um, we have just a un two unique, two unique opportunities. And one is that we have money, not tons of money. We have resources, we have people with knowledge, we have supplies, we have connections. So we actually can really help issues in the wild, projects already going in the wild. Like we, we've got these great tools um, to insert ourselves um, within those challenges and do some real good. And two, we have access to millions of people. Like more people come to zoos than come to like sporting events. We see almost a million people a year. So we have the opportunity to connect someone to an animal and then give them a message of an action they can take every day in their lives, something they can do and really do behavior change. Some of us like, deeply study the science behind it, behavior change and, and social dynamics and what will make a person do recycle, you know, what, what's the trick? So we, we aim to do those kind of things at the zoo, really, we wanna open the eyes of every single visitor. 
Um, and what and then the things that we get to do are amazing. So on a broader scale, um, really for almost every endangered species that we have at the zoo, um, many of them are rescued. Um, we have a project that we really believe in somewhere out in the world, you know, and some of them have been like 30 year, 20 year relationships with an elephant project, a chimpanzee project, um, a sun bear project, lion projects. So in these regions of the world, a lot in Uganda, Kenya, Guatemala, Borneo, um, we have these like family relationships with people. I mean, hold my phone, you're gonna get a WhatsApp from someone in another country within 24 hours, um, connecting, asking for something, finding a way we can help, get a new idea. Um, so our job is to think about those animals, find our place within the conservation of those animals, and then just pour out our resources, anything we can do. And we've really come a far way in conservation being our little department with education to conservation just being infiltrated with every single staff member. Like their interview questions are gonna make sure that they understand about conservation and animal welfare. Um, everybody is gonna have conservation messages that they can give to the public from janitorial to the person who is at the gift shop. Um, we all wanna be engaged in it in some way. And it really feels like through all those means out there in the world where we're, we're moving, you know, we're making change. And then we get to do things right on site. So it's out there in the world, this world vision, and we're, we're doing great things right where we are. So I'll let Adrian talk about that. Hi. Yes, so we are doing a lot of work, not only in the world, as Amy mentioned, but on site. And it involves having forever homes for a lot of rescue animals. So most of the animals we have up at California Trail they were not from a breeding program. We don't breed animals with the intention of display. We really view the zoo as an opportunity for these ambassador animals to have a forever home. So we have mountain lions whose parents were tragically killed and they were orphans. We have bears that were becoming, uh, that were becoming problematic in areas and we were able to save them from euthanization and give them a forever home here at the zoo. And, in addition to that, we do a lot of on-site work with animals that will remain in the wild. So we have a condor program where we take in birds that have become ill from eating lead bullets, uh, lead pellets that are left over in carcasses, and they'll be re-released in Big Sur and other areas in California. We are working locally with the Respiring Rabbit program where they're being affected by an Ebola-like virus. We're immunizing them here at the zoo and releasing them back into the wild and monitoring them to make sure that this vaccine is in fact helping the population and preventing them from extinction. And then we have a really extensive program on site, which is part of our amphibian crisis response. And this is working with local um, mountain yellow-legged frogs, different species, it turns out, in different regions of our local Sierra mountains and preventing them from dying from the chytrid fungus. So this fungus is affecting amphibians all over the world. We have found a way to help them build up an immunization to it and release them back into the wild. And this is an ongoing program with numerous different partners, or sorry, all these programs work with different partners throughout the world, different government organizations, different NGOs. So really it's not just us working in isolation, we're really working with other communities and other projects around to really help all of our native species. Sounds so good. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it is good work. It feels so good to be part of it. Um, we wanted to also talk a little bit about um, some of the other pieces of the mission. So our, our mission as an organization is conservation and education. And I'll just speak from personal experience. I was a child and I immigrated to the United States as a 10 year old and I, um, I was a child who did not grow up in a place where I had close access to, you know, open spaces or, you know, what you might call nature. I was a very urban child. And for me, the, the couple times that I had a chance to visit zoos, um, that those were impactful moments. And I always think back to that when I see that, um, you know, as a, as an educator now, um, that 
it, sometimes it's it's just a a very small moment, but having an opportunity to really experience an animal and its behavior, and in some cases, just that that you know, kind of it takes your breath away a little bit to see um, how incredible these these um, creatures can be, and so that I think actually in itself is really worth um, the education component of connecting people, giving people an opportunity to learn about habitats and animals, um, you know, in our case, from all over the world. Um, so I, I relish that. Um, Ashley and I are currently working on um, a really fun curriculum co-design project with um, school, public school, Title I public school teachers to really expand um, now that we have this California trail exhibit that's focused on the biodiversity of California, we want our local school um, youth to have access to some really innovative experiential opportunities to learn about native wildlife, native habitats and conservation practices as well as um, climate resilience and, and climate literacy at large. So we've been working on this project. It's really exciting. The teachers that are participating are fourth grade, middle school and high school teachers. And essentially we're just bringing educators in from the classroom all together to the table to really provide what students and teachers need as opposed to just guessing like, oh, we think this is cool. We wanna you know, give them this experience or provide this you know, participatory science activity. Um, so we're having a really good time with that. Ashley, do you wanna say any, a little bit more about the California Trail Project? Um, well, like Wilson said, California Trail opened in 2018, um, and to the best of my knowledge, this is the first program that is incorporating teacher design in an education program like this. And so it's asking the teachers, what is it that your students need? What is it that you can actually use within the classroom? And not just in the classroom itself, but things that you know we're in this digital world and so even if students aren't able to come to the zoo in person how can they experience california trail virtually um, and building kits where teachers can bring the zoo to the classroom um, and that's something that, that that's going to be our new normal um, and with this whole pandemic we've also launched a whole virtual zoo school program so classes that we normally teach in person are now being done through Zoom or you know, this virtual medium, which is incredible because I've actually taught classes to students that don't even live in California. Um, I've done classes for students in Oklahoma. I've done classes for, you know, other states, you know, as far as New York. And I think that's incredible because that's the way, you know, students outside of California, outside of the Bay Area can experience, you know, the great things that are happening at Oakland Zoo. And I just think that is, you know, a wonderful blessing, even though this pandemic kind of sucks. But that is one of the the, the silver lining through this you know, whole experience. I agree, Ashley. It's been exciting to go from. So, you know, typically we would have zoo camp and we would have uh, zoo schools. That's uh, teachers would bring their class on a field trip to the Oakland Zoo and have a guided activity that's connected to what they're learning about in the classroom. Um, and we felt strongly when um, the pandemic, about a year ago, when the pandemic closed down, you know, in-person schooling and the zoo, we felt strongly that we wanted to, um, you know, still provide that opportunity. And so we just jumped right into it with everybody else and continued to do the field trips uh, on Zoom and it's been a lot of fun. Um, and it's amazing. In fact, there's some, some aspects of um, getting to know an animal really close up on camera that where you can actually get a much closer look at the scales on a snake or you know the eyes on a tenrec. Um, so it's been kind of interesting to learn about the opportunities that the video conference format provides for learning. Um, and you know we are, we have kind of a big eyes around you know how we can really be part of the broader environmental informal environmental um, education community. So we collaborate with other um, agencies that do environmental education and we're really looking to 
um, be um, a resource for teachers and students and other, um, other folks interested in education. All right, well, with that, I wanted to also um, give um, Amy and Dan an opportunity to share a little bit about our current campaign. This is our big focus for the year. Uh, it's our uh, illegal wildlife trade um, campaign. And so I'm, I'm gonna send it off to Amy to share a little bit more about what we're doing about that. Okay, maybe I'll talk a little bit about the pledge and the bigger picture and then Dan can talk about the cool exhibit. Um, so we've, Adrian and I um, got really excited a couple years ago about um, really kicking, we always have a conservation message, you know, whether it's recycling, palm oil, um, but we thought real, we can make headway in this world with real campaigns, get gathering signatures, um, a variety of things where we're bringing people together to do an action and that action could really have a great result. Um, and what we decided is rather than have a lot of little ones, which we'll probably can't help ourselves, we're still, we're gonna try one big one a year. And that really helps get all of our staff on board, our board of directors on board, get more media attention and get more bang. Um, we really have concerns about the illegal wildlife trade. Um, so that is, you know, poaching animals from the wild for pets, for food, for fashion, um, pulling animals from the wild so you can get a selfie when you're on vacation with a parrot or a lizard. Um, we don't like any of that. Um, and some of our animals at the zoo are from that. So we have really specific stories that hurt our hearts. Um, we have partners in the wild like Arcus and Guatemala, which Adrian's planning a double eco trip to if you wanna go, <laughs> post in the link. Um, and they rehabilitate and release animals caught in that trade. So we're very close to this issue. We decided this is gonna be our big issue of the year. And we really wanted to create um, knowledge and compassion and action in, in all of our guests. And we decided rather than getting hugely broad, we're going to focus down to three main pledges we want people to take that has to do with how they buy things. Um, and it's about being mindful of your purchases with fashion and food. Um, it could be a feather earring you think is a great idea you know, or some sort of bone necklace that's tribal vibe or whatever it is, we're asking you to ask questions. So we give people the questions to ask, where did you get this? What are your ethics? Um, and we also give people our alternatives. Um, we really wanna send a message to the supplier that people care, people are smart, they're on to you and they, they want sustainable stuff. We, we don't wanna cause pain because we just didn't know. Um, the other is about pet choices. So we really want people to be mindful of their pet choices. Um, California is super strict. Um, you might know that if you're trying to get a ferret or a hedgehog as a pet, you're really not supposed to in this state, but people do. Um, and we want them to make really good choices. If you must have a parrot as a pet, here's some rescue organizations and please be careful about that choice. But it also extends around social media. Um, if you guys remember that slow loris being tickled in their belly video that was really popular for a while, that led to people demanding slow lorises and people from various, you know, villages pulling them out of the forest to ship to us so we could have that pet. Um, no good. So we're trying to say, don't circulate those videos or circulate them with a message. Um, one of my favorites that's not on there is if you're on a dating app, always swipe left with some lady or man holding like an alligator or a parrot or a tiger, no. Um, and the other is around travel. So if you are someone who gets to travel, be really careful before you ride an elephant, feed an elephant, pet something, get your picture taken with a tiger, even travel all the way to some lion helping sanctuary, like do your homework. So we're really um, focusing in on those, you know, you just got to be knowledgeable and it's a lot of being not afraid to ask. So with those three pledges, we're really hoping to um, create a very knowledgeable community around Oakland Zoo and beyond. And then when you come to zoo, you can do a really cool thing as well. And Dan can tell you about that. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, as Amy was mentioning, um, conservation has really been kind of embedded in, in all the different departments across the zoo. It used to be really just kind of in the education department and animal care. 
um, but now it's really being seen across every department throughout the zoo. And last year was uh, one of the first campaigns that I really saw a huge um, acceptance of, of this campaign, you know, from the gift shop um, to, you know, marketing, every, everything really just making sure that our plastic usage, um, our consumption was, we were really focused on reducing our plastic consumption and it was seen in lots of different departments. So this year, again, as Amy was talking about uh, combating the illegal wildlife trade, we're, we're doing that as well. And whereas last year we wanted you to see something that really had that representation of plastic, we had giant sculptures through this program, uh, this project called Wash the Shore based out of Oregon. This year, our focus, what you can come see now is this um, space that really is an exhibit on the um, combating the illegal wildlife trade. Um, this was an open space in our African Savannah area that we hadn't been using for years. And we finally just said, you know, we can use this space. And one of the cool things about the zoo too, is we have a great partnership with Fish and Wildlife. Um, they, a lot of the confiscations that come through airports come to us. So the fact that a government, you know, run agency trusts us with all these things is really, you know, is something to be proud about. So we, unfortunately we have a lot of it because it's yeah. such an issue and we didn't know what to do with it. And then there's also people that just say, oh, I have this old fur jacket or this old ivory pin from my grandma. What do I do with it? They give it to us. So we figured this is a great opportunity to kind of display these as kind of the medium to teach this whole, um, this whole idea that a lot, like this is still an issue. It, it, it's not going away unless we really change uh, the way we are as consumers and the way we make our choices. So you can come to the zoo, you can visit this space, you can walk around and see all these items. Some of them are pretty shocking in my opinion, some, um, and some you wouldn't never even think of um, as being an issue. And uh, you can learn all about that and how it's harming uh, different animals in the wild. So um, that's my marketing plug to come visit the zoo. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, the exhibit, I was just um, talking with one of our educators this morning who's, who's spending time there, you know, as guests are coming into the space and seeing some of these items and learning about, you know, things like pangolin scales and the demand for those and, and various different animal parts. Um, and again, it's, a, it's an issue that involves, you know, a, a big web of different you know, supply, demand, international um, kind of it doesn't doesn't have any boundaries or borders, and there are a lot of different stakeholders involved in uh, combating the illegal wildlife trade or the trade in, in endangered um, animals. And uh, the the reaction from you know guests who come to the zoo who may you know may be you know a really passionate environmentalist. Um, or they may, you know, have some sense that maybe have heard of endangered or threatened animals, or or they may not have a lot of background or a lot of uh, previous knowledge coming in. But the reaction um, and the conversations that we've been having with people has been um, just really for you know I speak for myself and for this educator I was talking to this morning. But it's just really an important and sometimes difficult conversation to have to really understand, um, you know, the impact and, and it's, it's the number two threat to species um, in terms of, you know, endangered species and, and the reasons that they are um, going extinct. So it's, it's a big one to tackle and, and we're honored to do it. And, and we hope that we can, you know, involve more people in the conversation um, that may not have, you know, had a, had a segue to it. Um, all right, well, with that, I wanna pivot a little bit um, and I would love for Wilson to share a little bit about his active research at the zoo, which has to do with, you know, the experience and the perception of um, coming to the zoo and what different people might be taking away from that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's kind of been, uh, uh, several people have alluded to this, but, you know, the goal of a zoo is to inspire these really meaningful connections um, and get people to sort of take action because of these experiences. Um, and that isn't just like something that we say, it's something that increasingly there's a growing body of research that is like really critical about how exactly that gets done. Um, so it's coming from fields like conservation psychology and visitor studies and education. Um, and it, there's a lot of really interesting work. Um, and so it's, and this is something that I'm kind of interested in in terms of like my studies at Cal in both social sciences and conservation. Um, and so, Right now, um, I'm working with Kat and with um, uh, the director of 
I don't know what Darren's title is. Um, <laughs> our <laughs> VP of welfare, maybe. Um, but anyways, we are working together to do some um, research on how guests are viewing our animals and understanding the welfare that we're providing them um, and how this relates to things like their background um, and the types of feelings that they experience while they're at the zoo. Um, and so it's been, I've, I've learned a lot so far and, and we're hoping to, to finish up by the end of the summer. Um, it's been a neat project, but, but there, if you're interested at all in any of that conservation psychology stuff, there's a, there's a lot of very interesting mm -hmm. research on the types of experience that folks have at the zoo. Um, and I'm sure you can find me if, if you wanna know more, I'm happy to chat about that stuff. Yeah, of course. so it's really a beautifully elegantly designed study and it's been already really um, interesting to see the initial results. So Wilson, congratulations on that. Definitely um, well thought out. Um, at this point, um, Cecilia and Jed, I don't know if we wanna take questions. We're also happy to kind of go deeper into some of our backgrounds as it pertains to pathways, career pathways in terms of environmental careers, uh, but happy to go either way if there are questions or if we wanna just give everybody a little more time to talk about their uh, background and, and how they got there. Yeah, um, so anybody who's listening in right now or in the video as well, um, feel free to send Jed and I your question directly or another panelist. Um, I believe you also have access to raise your hand. So feel free to raise your hand if you wanna ask a question um, and we'll go from there. But to give them time to submit some questions, I know that personally I kind of felt um, you know, like Tiger King was like a chance for a lot of people to kind of expose um, themselves and kind of educate themselves on uh, zoos and the credentials around uh, caring for animals. Do you have any experiences with, you know, visitors talking to you about them or um, anything that came from that experience in general? As I know it was pretty national, national trend. <laughs> hmm, I think I... I'll go. I wrote a whole blog about this when it was happening. It was such a like bizarre, like centerpiece of the beginning of COVID. Like we're all stuck home. Let's all watch this. Um, but we were thrilled that there was an exposure and really to show a difference. Like, you know, it breaks my heart when people say, you know, zoos are this or, you know, captive animals are that because there's so many, so many nuances and stories. And like, I feel we're at the like farthest end of the as many rescues as we can, as much conservation as we can spectrum. And that that is on a totally different end of the spectrum. But what, what stood out for me about that was just that people who came to that location came because they loved animals and it was just a misplaced love. And that is usually a lot of the problems with, you know, illegal pet trade, you want that pet because you love it. You want that 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 jacket because it you love this pattern you know it really is speaks to people's innate desire to be close to animals and close to nature um, we want that um, so we really feel like that exposed where that desire can go wrong when there's manipulative people um, and the lack of education so it made it even more we got to it even more strongly and I believe the illegal wildlife trade um, even like AZA, all the zoos um, really jumping on that um, almost was a direct reflection of this, you know, this country's, you know, obsession with the subject matter. Um, so it was a really good opportunity. I just want to jump in real quick about that. Um, I thought it was really funny. We were, I, what I'm really proud of the Oakland Zoo is that we're always, I, I feel like we're always one step ahead in the term, in terms of like animal care and welfare. And we actually had developed all this signage around the exact opposite of Tiger King. And then that happened at the end of February of, of last year. And then we closed. So when the zoo reopened, everyone thought, oh, probably thought the signage was in reflection of Tiger King. But we're like, no, 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 no. We did that before. <laughs> we already knew. So I just want to say, I like, I like claiming that. So. <laughs> Nice, Dan. Right, that's I'll just share a quick personal reflection about Tiger King um, because, you know, I was sucked into it by friends who were nonstop, you know, telling me I had to watch it. And I did. And um, my frustration was how little animal welfare was actually addressed by the, the sort of 
you know, approach of the film or the, the project. Um, so it really like the big takeaway in the way that it was positioned was really about humans, right? And, and our flawed nature. Um, and yet I think there was so much more to say about the welfare side and, and what was going on at these different facilities and how the animals were experiencing it. Uh, but you know, that's just my own, <laughs> that was my own takeaway from it. But yeah, it's, it's definitely our Teen Wild Guides um, have been, um, you know, having some really interesting conversations uh, because it's still something that is kind of in the public radar um, in terms of tiger petting, you know, cub petting and, and breeding for animals in captivity. And the fact that there are more tigers in kind of, you know, roadside or private holdings uh, than in the wild, which is pretty, that's a pretty dramatic fact. Yeah. I see a really great question in the chat um, that I think there's several folks here that have good answers to. Uh, what questions yeah. should people be asking? What do you think, Amy? Well, I wrote down some, but it's you know worth a conversation. But we, Adrian and I, just made this an email out to people who took our pledge, and what we say is like just act curious. So you know, um, hey, you know, let's say it's a barrette. I don't know. Um, what is this made of? You know, it's made of bone. Like, what kind of animal is that? Is it? Um, is it an? Is this an animal that was killed anyway from a ranch for food? Did you find it? Um, it's. Is it a wild animal? Is it a wild endangered animal? Um, do, can you trace the origin? Um, and then I, I think one of the best things is I'm really interested in, you know, I care about animal welfare. I love this. I love this Barrett, but I care about animal welfare and sustainability. Can you tell me more about it? Um, and if they've got a good answer, you know, I met a lady at a festival who was selling found feather earrings. And, and not only did I say thank you so much, but I said, I'm going to tell all my friends about that. And you tell all your colleagues how much we care about that. And that's a huge service you can do. And if you do sign up for the pledge, you will get follow-up emails that have these specific questions that you can ask. Mm -hmm. So if you are more curious, really please sign up for the pledge. It's gonna be really informative and really helpful. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll add just a quick note yeah. that we've been working with a group at Castlemont High School in East Oakland. Um, it's a student club, uh, it's called the Pacific Bridge Club. And they are um, organizing, they've done now for a few years, a uh, big trip to East Asia. Um, and their focus is really community work and, and cultural exchange. And uh, they, are, they worked with um, our animal care staff to understand the welfare situation specifically for sun bears uh, before they went to Cambodia. And now they're headed to Thailand in um, July of this year. And they have been, um, really engaging deeply in, in exactly what questions to ask of the various different places that they visit that do have animals on site. Uh, because sometimes it's not, you know, it's not immediately apparent if you go to a wildlife um, a sanctuary, sometimes they're called a sanctuary, it's not immediately apparent what the standard of animal care is or what the backstory of the of the individual animals that may be there. Um, so that the, that youth group in East Oakland is doing some really interesting work on the ground, preparing for that trip. So if anyone's interested in that, I'm happy to share more about that. I see another great question. Can I just about, add to that really quickly, Kat, since you went in that direction, anybody who wants to travel, um, both Airbnb and TripAdvisor now have like established staff members who do this research. Um, so they do are starting to rate um, those kind of wild travel experiences um, as, you know, ethical or not ethical, because there's a lot of greenwashing out there. So there's some good resources. Thank you, Amy. I wanted to address the question around transportation um, that I saw pop up. And yes, we're not far away. The Oakland Zoo is um, not really easy BART, but not too bad. So you would go to Coliseum or San Leandro BART and then take an AC bus up to uh, where basically, oh, Dan knows more details. Give us the full, give us the full number. Oh, 40, the 46L line will take you to the zoo. Yeah, 46L. Yeah, and right now we are open, um, and but you do want to go online and get the tickets in advance uh, because it is by reservation due to COVID-19 restrictions. Yeah, yeah and also um, I know Wilson uh, is also uh, a current student at UC Berkeley, so um, 
if they're willing to maybe put their email or connect with me afterwards to get in touch, um, you can definitely send me your email, who, whoever um, asked that question to get in touch with them. Yeah, I can, I can add a little bit to that. Um, my freshman year, I interned at the zoo and I didn't have a car and I took public transportation and it was like, definitely, it wasn't easy, but it was doable. Um, and so, sorry. Um, but in terms of like broader the question, how can you get involved with conservation as an undergrad at Cal? There's lots of really cool stuff happening on campus. And if you are here, you probably know that there's lots of great resources like that. Um, but I can plug a couple of specific professors. Um, Professor Arthur Middleton does some really interesting work um, in Argentina and also in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem with carnivores and um, conservation there. And he has a lot of really interesting grad students that are worth looking at. Um, Dr. We have a new professor, Chris, Chris Shell, um, who does some really interesting work on urban wildlife. Um, and he has just started, but his lab is going to be full of some really interesting people. And then also Justin Bruchers, um, who does work mostly in Africa um, with different like wildlife trade, economic system, lots of neat stuff. So, so check those people out if you're looking for conservation opportunities at Cal. Um, and in my experience, like there's always grad students who are looking for undergrads to do work for them. Um, and so if you can find the right person and just like ask them some questions and see if they need any help. Um, I've, I've learned a lot that way. Yeah, I'll chime in Wilson. That was definitely my, my path as an undergrad. Um, I just asked a lot of questions and was pretty nosy about people's research and went to a lot of seminars and listened to a lot of um, kind of casual conversations. And I did, um, I think my second year, I did a summer field work in the Cascades with Mary Poteet in integrative biology who was studying parasites and dicamped it on Pacific giant salamander. And that actually led to pretty much everything else that, you know, just was sort of a one thing leads to another. And so through Mary Poteet, I ended up, um, working with Wayne Souza's lab, doing mangrove forest regeneration, um, went to Panama eight times and then lived in Panama for two years after graduation doing uh, work with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. So I, I highly encourage just what you said, Wilson, which is just finding out about research you're interested in and you know, getting involved with it um, and, and, and being open to maybe doing something that you didn't initially think was something that you, you were going to get involved with, but just trying it out because you might be surprised. <laughs> and I, I always like to add, since I've done these panels so much, um, that thing that I didn't know is that if you're, maybe all of you guys are sciencey and that's how you landed here to begin with but any skill set really can make its way into helping animals. You know, it could be writing, film, educating, it could be law, um, it could be exhibit design and artistry. Um, we employ sometimes a chalk right, drawer. <laughs> um, there's so much that, you know, so many different skills can come to be all over the world um, that can help this cause. And, and yes, community work and research is a huge part of it too. But. I I'd also like to say that if you don't have a car, if you have a phone, that's one of the easiest ways to really like do conservation. You have a platform that can reach out to millions and millions of people. Well, it depends how many friends you have, but like you can <laughs> using your platform, you can really just reach out. Uh, we work for a nonprofit. I can't give as much money as I would like to give to many different organizations, but I can share something that I'm passionate about. And then maybe my aunt who would have given her money to like, QVC or something instead will donate to this organization that I have a passion for instead. All I would say though is to just make sure you're doing, you're double checking your sources and you're not just willy nilly sharing anything that you come across. But uh, social media is such a great platform to really do conservation work and really spread what you're passionate about. Great, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate your time here. Um, yeah, Jed, do you have any closing statements? Uh, just thank you so much, all of you. This was really informative and definitely cleared up a lot of, um, you know, my own personal like understandings of conservation work and just, yeah, it really seems like Oakland Zoo is like 
a gold standard. And thank you all for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with all of us. Thank you. It's been an honor. Good luck to everyone. Come see us. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.